So this might not be exactly a direct follow-up on lie, but I do think those sort of alternative cinematic practices lead to the thinking of the American avant-garde, which emerges, let's say, in the 1940s. Um, so I'm just going to run through a, a couple of sort of quick examples of, uh, of American avant-garde, uh, and then one of the major sort of advancements or, or moments that happens in the 1960s that's defined by a uh, scholar named P. Adam Sidney, which is the moment of structural film. Um, structural film is a term that Sidney comes up with. It's a very controversial term. Uh, the we'll, we'll get to that, I, I suppose. Um, but I think that, that the structural film emerges around the same time as the expanded cinema movement um, shows this kind of materialist concern, this materialist turn to film, uh, to what makes film unique as an artistic medium um, in, an almost, uh, in an almost modernist way, thinking about really the basics of, uh, of what film is and what it can be by exploring the limitations uh, of, uh, of the medium and by exploring the literal mechanisms uh, of the medium. And that begins somewhat with, with the American avant-garde, which emerges again in the 1940s. One of the earliest examples uh, of an uh, American avant-garde film is Meshes of the Afternoon by Maya Darren from 1943. Again, I'm not going to have you watch this, although I would highly encourage you uh, to do so. Um, Meshes of the Afternoon focuses on, is shot on 16 millimeter, as I note here, um, a smaller, a uh, little bit cheaper than 35 millimeter, which became the common, commonly used film stock in Hollywood. The cameras are smaller and handheld. They can be, uh, you know, purchased by individuals. Still pretty expensive uh, at the time, but but they can be used in a different way beyond sort of industrial Hollywood production. Um, and that's exactly what Maya Darren does in in meshes, uh, re recording a, a kind of circular narrative uh, of focusing on her. This is the this is Maya Darren, who also stars in this film. I guess you could you could call it that. Um, but she sort of goes and uh, and investigates four different versions of herself that are manifesting over time uh, until it leads to a kind of uh, dramatic. Uh, sort of dramatic inclusion, but one that's uh, one that again is repetitive and circular, and resists the kind of logics of of Hollywood narrative uh, filmmaking. Darren has a number of other films of interest, so I, I'd really encourage you to look into her work. Um, uh, and then the figure um, Stan Brackage, uh, who's working usually in Colorado in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, Brackage is, is really seen as the, the forefather of the American avant-garde for taking film and trying to elevate it to the status uh, of an art um, or to, to a, a different kind of artistic status, let's say, let's say, by focusing on the expressive potential of the individual, uh, of the camera as, uh, as part of the artist's eye or an extension of the artist's eye, um, but one that's not just about seeing the world as it is, but having a really expressive internal vision of the artist's experience with the world around them. Um, and you can see this example in, in Dog Star Man from 1961 to 63. This is an image from the prelude, this kind of cosmic um, consciousness that emerges uh, over, over a period of time. And of course, if you're thinking about the history of art, this might connect uh, rather directly to something like abstract expressionism and the work of Jackson Pollock who's again giving this internal vision, this seemingly unmotivated uh, chance-based uh, dance of, uh, of paint splattered onto the canvas. If you look at Brackage's films, he often cuts or uh, edits very, very, very quickly. Frames pop up for just a split second and then they go away. Um, so even when he's recording images rather than working directly on the film stock, and I think you see here, uh, an example of something that was quite like Lin Lai in that um, Stan Brackett started painting and scratching directly onto the film stock uh, to kind of mark it in a new way, right? And, and to mark the hand of the artist into the film in a new way. So all of these are kinds of advancements of, 
of the great individual um, who's using film for for this new new creative potential and a new way of looking at the world, a new way of seeing the world that's offered by uh, by the moving image and by all of the potentials of the moving image, whether that's recording uh, or or working directly on on the film stock. So. Brackage's work is very wide ranging. He has a number of works that are are hand painted, um, completely abstract works, where, whereas others have senses of abstraction to them, but are shot and recorded, such as his uh, his sort of notorious now, I guess, film Window Water Baby Moving, um, that was a documentation of uh, of his uh, of his first child's birth. Um, so uh, you can look into that uh, perhaps on your own uh, and then look into Carolee Schneeman's Fuses that was a direct response, a kind of feminist response to, uh, to Brackage's uh, Window Water Baby moving. But with that, um, we can move forward sort of half a step. This is around the same time uh, where within the American avant-garde there becomes this notion of structural film. This is a term, um, again, that was defined by P. Adam Sidney in his book Visionary Film from 1974. So again, to be, to be perfectly clear, the examples that we're looking at, the artists were not going out saying, I'm going to make a structural film. A structural film becomes a term after the fact that, that Sidney uses to kind of bring these films together and again, to elevate them in a certain sense for their for their sort of goals and for their ambition. Um, so I, I think it's important to know that it is a, a term after the fact. This isn't like a, a movement that's happening where, where people are running around saying, I'm a structural filmmaker, right? I think that that doesn't really happen, um, except for, you know, now I think people look back at this and they're like, oh, I'm going to do like a structural film kind of thing. And it's like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's not really not really how this worked uh, when this was emerging, but, uh, but whatever, I guess. Anyway, um, Sidney defines the structural film as films that engage with these four kind of key things, uh, whether they're using a fixed camera position, uh, flicker effects or stroboscopic lighting, loop printing, that means uh, sort of using an optical printer to, to create film loops, uh, or kinds of re-photography, uh, which also goes to optical printing in, in some respects. Um, and so I'm just going to mention a couple sort of classics of structural film, and then you're going to watch one um, that I'll probably give a separate introduction to just because I want to be very clear about, uh, about what you're going to encounter. But one of the great structural films that uh, hopefully in your time at Alfred uh, I'll be able to, to bring and screen is Michael Snow's Wavelength from 1967. This uh, shot is sort of representative of what happens in the film. This was known uh, or is sort of always commented upon as being a 45 minute long zoom of a room that takes place in one shot or kind of looks like it takes place over one shot in 45 minutes. So you see this kind of wide view. Uh, you're kind of in the back of the room here. The camera slowly zooms and zooms and zooms and zooms and zooms in on this object here this picture uh, on the wall um, and while this happens ver uh, various people enter the apartment giving some sense of a narrative but it's really about that movement and the trajectory forward of the camera at the same time the soundtrack starts out uh, in a kind of low warble. You can barely kind of hear it or notice it, uh, but it's following sine waves that would be like up and down. As the film goes, the waves, the audio waves get thinner and thinner until it really is a high-pitched buzz or a hiss uh, towards the end of the film. So uh, this film really introduces all the elements of filmmaking, I think. It uh, has a beginning and ending. It has events that emerge that make us want to consider what's going on. But nonetheless, there's this endless progression forward, this, this movement forward that can't and won't be stopped um, from the camera, right? Maybe symbolizing both a, a kind of metaphoric role of consciousness uh, as well as the film experience itself. It's hard not to watch Wavelength and think about the projector, the film projector in the back of the room that's shooting onto a wall in front of it, right? The, the shot itself here almost mimics 
mimics the projector and the role of film. So that's sort of what structural film is doing, right? It's thinking, uh, it's thinking about these the different components of what make up the filmic experience, the cinematic experience, uh, and it's exploiting them um, both to sort of put the viewer in a in a strange, maybe even uncomfortable position in relationship to to the images, but really to make us think about what the experience of a, of a film is like what's happening when we look at a, when we look at a film or watch a film what expectations do we bring to a film what do we sort of what do we expect to happen how do we expect it to proceed um, and how can you give maybe the the barest bone elements of that while still sort of fully presenting what what film is and what it can be, um, and I think that you see that in Wavelength. Again, there's there's a really terrible YouTube copy of Wavelength um, that uh, almost isn't worth watching. But if you're interested in this at all.